Ganga, thank you for coming on the <laughs> coming on the stream. Thanks so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here. So, so I'm excited, yeah, to talk about uh, all things nudge and the environment. Um, and there's a lot to talk about because we wrote a paper about this recently together, along with with Stuart Mills. Um, but for the first thing I wanted to ask about was you, um, because I know that your background. Uh, is very interdisciplinary. You've sort of sought for uh, a place to express your your interests in the environment and in other questions, and that's that's found you a bit of a nomad, right? Uh, you've sort of wandered between different disciplines. So could you talk us through that? Sure. Thanks so much for having me, and hi to everyone watching on the stream as well. Um, yeah, so I'm originally from India, and I did my under well, I actually did science in school, and then um, I came across a textbook of a friend um, who did economics, and one of the things it said um, I had no idea what economics was honestly, and it, it one of the things I first read was, oh, it's about how to understand what drives people to be better off and about what makes them happy. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I guess I guess that's worth thinking about. And that's how I actually ended up into economics. I could have also done zoology actually, because um, you know there was an early sort of inkling that I want to do something around conservation and environmental stuff. Um, so I really had to choose between economics and zoology and I went for economics. Um, so when I actually did economics for my undergrad, it was quite a, a traditional sort of degree and in some ways, and I really couldn't identify with many of the assumptions, especially in things like microeconomics. And I, you know, there, there was also my my department actually at the time did very interesting other sorts of economics. I remember doing ecofeminism. I remember doing agricultural economics and development stuff. But actually, the main part of economics, which is the core of it, I couldn't really identify with or buy. So when I actually wanted to understand a bit how the world works, I said, okay, economics is not going to really help me if this is it. So <laughs> it's not enough. So I actually did my master's in development and, and that was much more interdisciplinary. Um, I got exposed to a lot more sociology and anthropology and political economy stuff there and, and philosophy. And, th and that was really interesting. But then again, I, I thought actually to, to do policy work and to affect change at scale, you need economics anyway. So I worked for a few years in policy research in agriculture and food security. And then I ended up doing, um, that's when I came to the UK, when I did my master's um, in public administration and public and economic policy, really got back into the world of economics, um, got back into the world of things like policy impact evaluation and understanding the causes of things um, at, the, at the London School of Economics. And I said, okay, there's something here which needs unpicking. And so I ended up doing my PhD in environmental economics. So went away from policy back into economics again, but more applied economics. And um, then again, I got disillusioned because I was like, this is the, the traditional tools don't work. The assumptions don't work. So I did like a bit of a full circle. And so really I, I started to get, because I was interested in environmental issues, I thought the biggest problem <laughs> the biggest cause of a lot of environmental issues is human activity. There's a lot of scientific consensus on this. Um, if you look at the recent IPCC reports, um, increasingly scientists are sort of trying to hammer in the message that this is down to human activity at the industrial scale, at the systems level, but also at the individual level. So that's when I got more introduced and interested in psychological and behavioral science. And that's where I sit now. So in terms of my nomadic career... <laughs> It has been a bit all over the place, but I think that's been really helpful to understand environmental issues because they're complex. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 More so, perhaps more so than anything else, right? I think you can benefit from that interdisciplinarity. And, exactly. you know, I mean, it's interesting. I don't want to say everybody should have that kind of journey because you can't be that prescriptive, but I do think it's be it'd be beneficial for a lot of people um, just to see because knowledge silos are uh, just absolutely real. And economists, I mean, out of all people, have absolutely no clue what anthropologists think, how they do things, right? They don't have any clue really about envi the environment, the natural sciences, how natural scientists approach it. And I just think it's really beneficial. And I think it's interesting because although I haven't been quite as nomadic as you, a lot of 
what you expressed resonates with me because I, I just did a straight economics degree, uh, master's, PhD, right? But like you, a lot of the assumptions didn't really resonate with me. And I just, for the most part, saw my degree as a bunch of maths that I needed to do to pass the exams. And like, I wasn't necessarily bothered about whether or not it represented the real economy, right? And then like you, I kind of veered into behavioral economics because it was like, well, okay, at least they're actually saying, let's look at how people behave, you know, even if it's flawed, at least they're looking at experiments and they're looking at other data and they're actually asking people real people like what what they do and what they think right so that yeah. was kind of a bit a bit of an escape for me and that's how I ended up at PBS right because I was like oh well this is behavioral science is is another step beyond just behavioral economics it's like there are actually uh, psychologists here and uh, biologists as well in the department and you know people like yourself who may be um, very interdisciplinary so it's really interesting I think how alienating <laughs> an education in economics can be right absolutely because i think a lot of the times the assumption sort of box us into the you know there's this famous saying right all models are wrong until mm. they or whatever box um you know i used to believe that for a while and then some <laughs> sometimes now i'm just like actually when models are wrong they're so wrong yeah yeah <laughs> and they can lead, they really lead you astray in terms of the policy prescriptions mm. And the way to deal with this is actually work together with people who do have competing models and think about actually what the empirical reality is and how that fits with different theoretical traditions. Mm. And so from that sense, I think there is a space for theory, but I do believe that greater interdisciplinary work is really the way to go about it because there's a value in, in particular perspectives. But I think the real value, especially when dealing with complex problems, is when you bring those perspectives together and have that dialogue at the policy level as well as the academic level, keeping the reality and the ground reality in mind. So that's why in my work now, I'm really trying to work with people like conservation biologists who do have a different training and who see the world a particular way, but also using different methodological traditions like mixed methods, which involve both qual and quant work. Um, because especially if you're trying to if you're going with the view of understanding a space and it's an alien space to you, you can't go in with a priori assumptions of this is what human nature is like. That just doesn't work. Mm. And then that's, I think, one of the biggest reasons I think I still stick with behavioral science in a way is because there is so much conversation about how the environment can change the way people not just behave, but also perceive reality. And that's quite interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons I think intuitively, in a way, I find a home a bit. Um, but also the fact that you can be flexible and 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 still incorporate insights from other disciplines because your your focus is actually on trying to explain the ground reality. I think that's really where we need to do a bit more work anyway. I when, think one, when one person who springs to mind who I know we both like is Eleanor Ostrom, right? So, yes. you know, she just, she was very informed by economic theory. And I'm pretty sure her like background was originally in game theory, like very, some of the political, very mathematical. Political science. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, it was, yeah, it was political science. And yeah. then, but then she did, she was doing game theory, right? And like abstract and mathematical. And yeah. then she sort of said, well, what if I go and actually look at some people and places <laughs> and see how they actually do yeah. things? And I think her game theory it did it did structure what she was thinking because she was very focused on the free rider problem you know are people going to take advantage of collective resources um mm -hmm. but you know in the end her analysis really was just exactly what you said right going to a space trying not to have too many prior assumptions seeing how people do things and you know building an understanding based on that and it's always very complicated and it's very difficult to make generalizations absolutely and i think she's a really I'm glad that you brought her up because she was also someone who used mixed methods in her analysis and was very humble about the power of her own knowledge system to explain things there, but is, was able to really speak to that critically. So, you know, she questioned the very tenets of game theory, right? The way we think about the free rider problem as, as being basically, for instance, the commons as being characterized by the lack of property rights, which gives people bad incentives. But she really distinguished between commons which are collectively governed through informal institutions like social norms and psychological factors like the impulse to cooperate, but also made a very clear distinction between that as, as something which is actually a self-governing con commons as, as different from the absence of private property, which leads us all to ruin because of some weird Hobbesian nature that we all have, mm. which is just a chaos because we're all selfish. 
right? So she was able to see sort of the nuance there that, okay, there is an impulse to cooperate, but also be selfish. And, and really a lot of it depends on how institutions locally are structured, um, not just some unavoidable facet of human nature. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's this kind of armchair philosophy, I think, that like structures that the original interpretation of that problem. If you read the, the original Garrett uh, Hardin paper, he's just sort of uh, making stuff up. Uh, also a massive <laughs> racist who wanted like eugenics and population control, which I think Absolutely. is relevant because his view of humanity was just like, oh, we're just going to proliferate over the globe and not be able to govern ourselves. Special emphasis on obviously non-white, non-Western people, right, doing Absolutely. that. And it's Absolutely. just like, it's so, it's so wrong uh, and, you know, morally abhorrent as well. Uh, and, and it and also comes from a particular it. historical place. Mm. And it comes from a particular historical circumstance. Whereas when we think about human nature, we think of it as a historical something unchanging. Mm. Whereas actually our understandings of that are actually quite contextually informed, mm. <laughs> depending on who you have in mind, who you study, the ideology you bring to the table. And I think that's one of the things I think a lot of qualitative researchers do is sort of try to position themselves at the front of their research and sort of you really think about their own positionality. Whereas when we think of more mathematical economic theories, often that part is quite missing. Mm. Yeah, there's uh, this kind of like, who am I? <laughs> if you're interviewing someone, right, you get this. Yeah. This, I mean, I'm reminded of, uh, reminded of Elizabeth uh, Stokey that we we work with, right? She she does qual research and she has these really interesting presentations she does about um, f f phone calls to 999 or 911 that first the woman acts like she's ordering a pizza until the and keeps doing it until the person on the receiving end of the call gradually realizes she's not ordering a pizza she's a victim of domestic abuse right and it's like that as soon as you start talking to people i think positionality is what you called it right it's like uh, who am i right in this am i like a powerful figure am i an authority am i like an agent of the state do they trust me what about the wording of what i say right are they saying what they mean or is it implicit like in elizabeth's examples so it's just it just opens up an entirely new world compared to just either building an abstract mathematical model armchair philosophy philosophizing is that a word um yeah. or like even getting a data set right and just downloading a data set and taking all the answers for granted you, you need to do more to understand the social world yeah i mean even data collection is an interesting process mm. right so the way people interpret the questions can often leave a lot of room to actually what we're collecting like it's different if you have behavioral data which is say revealed where you've got like i don't know the number of phone calls someone makes but actually why people make those phone calls mm -hmm. the motivation behind that and the and the sort of mental states behind that can be so subjective so you can ask people questions and there's a lot of debate about this in the literature but the baseline is you know data can data is data mm -hmm. and you have to interpret all of that with the caveats of whether it's incomplete and how people read those questions, whether the same tool has the same meaning in in way it's interpreted across different contexts. So I think when we start to really get into this and, and, and are a bit more critical towards actually the tools we're using, I think there is quite a good strong case to make to use these sorts of multiple methods to understand the same sort of question. Mm. It always it always bothers me when you get um, people sort of <laughs> looking at GDP estimates in like sub-Saharan Africa from the year 1050 it's like you you don't you don't have that that doesn't mean anything in that context right like how did you get that and what what relevance do you think it had to the people there at the time it's just it's just absurd yeah actually david graber and wen Gore's book um is, is a nice oh, yeah. place to really think about like what we actually know about the past and you're talking about future forecasting data but also historical data mm. how, you know i think that's also a really interesting space which shows you could use things like archaeological data to mm. think about the knowledge gaps we have and actually how little we know about the past mm. um, and how that has huge implications for what we think about grand narratives of progress and lack of progress and things. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of midway to that and I recommend that. As yeah, a, I haven't I haven't started it yet. I, I really do need to. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just funny when you hear, you know, because you can hear all the, you can watch a documentary and you can be like, oh, you know, the people in the Bronze Age were doing this. And then when you go into the archaeology, it's like, how do you know that? And they're like, well, we found one tip of a spear in this place. And it's like engraved in such a way that we think, you know, and it's like, oh, my God, like, we don't actually know anything. I mean, I don't want to get too nihilistic, but I am, I, sometimes I'm like, what do we actually know anything about the past? Um. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the, the point is to be humble about what we do know mm. and then seek to sort of constantly 
you know, work with people who do have different perspectives yeah, yeah. and see if what we know generalizes in yeah. any way. <laughs> So, so let's um, move to like uh, the more immediate uh, issues of uh, behavioral science in the environment, because yeah. what, the, the reason the reason that uh, I'm talking to you ostensibly is that we we wrote a paper together, and mm. I actually shared it on my channel. So I don't know if some of the people who've joined might have read it, uh, but it was it was about what we called brown sludge, uh, yeah. which is basically a way of imped uh, a, a series of impediments to pro-environmental behaviors and the paper was actually your idea i remember you 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 uh you sort of proposed it to me in the corridor one day at LSE. uh so could you what was your motivation for this yeah so i mean when behavioral science and the whole nudge literature really took off um in the policy space and this would have been in the 2000s onwards there was a lot of hope i think um and maybe naivety about what the potential was of more psychologically informed interventions to change behavior. And of course, there's a whole political economy around this in the sense of, you know, it was quite focused on individual level behavior change and it bought in that lens. And that lens was essentially that actually, in many ways, people make mistakes because they're rational and they're rational because they have these sort of deviations from rational choice theory. Some of the micro assumptions that we were talking about before that people are selfish or people have perfect knowledge, perfect foresight things like this. And, and because of that, they often take these decisions which are against their best interests. So a lot of that literature in, in the early stages of Nudge, in my understanding, was often focused towards things like financial well-being, health decisions, and so on, right? Now, the environmental issue in terms of climate change or mass extinction, which is something else I study, mm. um, really is about not just what makes people better off as defined by themselves, but also what makes society more stable, more, more, you know, cohesive, better off as, as a whole, but also non-human societies, right? If you think about actually an ecosystem being stable and integral and functioning, right? Mm. So in that sense, you know, there was a lot of excitement as, okay, you know what, let's also think about how to apply these nudges to situations where there are externalities, where externalities in an economic sense was defined as basically impacts on a third party, Right. And they could be positive or negative. The typical illustration of this might be something like air pollution, which causes climate change. So you drive a car and that, you know, you might be better off because you get to where you need to go quicker. But then there are these social effects, which might be negative things like congestion, pollution and so on, which have a negative externality on people around you who have nothing to do with the choice of you to drive a car. Right. So the idea was like, can you also use nudging to say improve um, public transport use? Could you also use nudging to improve people to recycle better? And the way that was typically done was through changing the way you present information. So drawing attention to what other people were doing, for instance, pulling on things like social norms, social comparisons. Um, uh, one of the, Some of the most famous nudge experiments in this case was done on utility bills, where you show not just what your own consumption was, but also your neighbor's consumption. Yeah. Another way to do this was change the decision-making context, the choice architecture, right, by pre-selecting an option, but giving the people, you know, the option to drop out. So, you know, pre-selecting people to go with the green energy provider to reduce emissions from home energy use rather than, um, you know, going with the default, which is often a gray provider. Um, so renewables versus non-renewables and so on. So there was a lot of conversation about how we could use these sorts of approaches which don't put a financial cost on the decision through typically things like a carbon tax or um, a fee for recycling or something, or they don't put any bans and restrictions or mandates on how people ought to behave. And a lot of this literature did come from the US, right? So there was a lot of you know concern around things like personal freedom, yeah, um, and and not actually um, you know it, impinging on that. But also, on another hand, we do have a real contention that actually a flat tax on people might be regressive, especially from an environmental perspective. If people who are worse off in society or who have lower disposable income tend to consume dirty products. Yeah. So just a flat tax on them means that that tax would be regressive. So there are also fairness and distributional That's concerns. That's you get like the Gillette Jaune uh, protests in France, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so given this, like Nudges was seen as sort of third way mm. and sort of golden path. As more and more sort of evidence started to accumulate, there were three broad issues. One thing was nudges, the type of nudge and the effect of each nudge didn't generalize across different contexts, mm. right? So 
just because a nudge worked for one behavior in one population, it might not have worked in another behavior in another population. So a nudge works on recycling towel use in the US, but not in Germany, for instance, in a hotel. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a typical example of paper, which didn't generalize. Right. Another issue was the fact that the effect sizes were really small. Mm. Right. So you'd actually want to put a fair amount of time into designing good nudge, especially because the effect sizes were quite large, but the effect sizes were actually quite small. So what that meant was essentially if the nudge was successfully scaled up across the population, that might have compensated for a small effect size. But if it if it was small, non-generalizable, and it didn't mm. scale up very much either, then that was an issue. And that brings us to the third problem, which is actually there were questions about whether there was actually a long-term effect of nudges. So once a nudge was in place, did it actually persist? And in, in all these cases, there was a huge debate about whether they actually worked, mm. right? Um, often because the way in the academic literature, at least, and even in some policy literatures, it was pitched was nudge could be seen as a third way not as one of the many ways that you use to address yeah. climate change. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so there was this big conversation about whether they work or not, which has been um, quite active in the literature and behavioral science over the past few years. Lots of papers about it. Where our paper sort of came into it and my thinking came into it was, but there are real structural and systemic issues which reduce their efficacy. Mm but which also create a strong case for using multiple sorts of policy instruments, whether they're financial instruments like taxes and subsidies, whether that's actually a case for big investments in infrastructure, whether that's a case for actually good regulations, which are things on like minimum water quality and standards and like, you know, um, compliance laws and so on. So if you really think about the range of tools we have to address something like climate change, We've got a whole range of tools and, and they're all there for a reason and they all have their strengths and limitations. So one way I was thinking about encapsulating that and presenting that in the context of the nudge literature was actually we live in fossil fuel structures, right? Um, our systems are often built on quite brown infrastructures. Yeah. So in that sense, actually, we live in quite a sludgy setup. And a sludge would be typically seen as an opposite of a nudge, things that make it harder for us to do the right thing rather than easier for us. And that's how I started to think about this more. It's not just that nudges don't work. They don't work because our contexts are fundamentally brown, right? Mm. And that does mean that you need a range of policy instruments, not just nudges, to address this issue. Because by relying on nudges, not just will you run into this issue of will it generalize, are the effect sizes small, Will they long? Will they be long-lasting? You're likely to find they're going to be small, not long-lasting, because mm. your structures would fundamentally go against green behavior. And in doing so, it's not just about individual choice, but also the social responsibility that we have as companies, as governments, to actually do something about it. Because the origin of the problem is not just individual. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of. Um... Well, it's farting against thunder, right? I suppose it's one way of putting it, right? If you've got like, I was trying to think of a non-disgusting way of saying that, but there's also pissing into the wind, but for some yeah. reason they're both, yeah. Anyway, like, uh, it's like, there's there's uh, there's uh, something like that. Anyway, you're, they're both like, it's just, there's so many structures, often physical structures, right? For example, one thing we talk about is roads and how cities are built around roads and therefore yeah. cars, as opposed to cycling and public transport. Um, and, and it's just, you know, if you're going to change the label on some packaging, uh, put a smiley face on a bike or something, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just really unlikely to have an effect. And I mean, you, you use the word naive and I think a, a lot, a lot of nudges are quite naive in that way, isn't it? Because it is literally like just a, a silly little message or a text to someone and something like, and it's like, yeah, look at the margin you're yeah. probably going to improve uptake. I think it's fine to streamline. I mean, some of, some of the processes that governments have used pre-nudge yeah. were ridiculous. It was like, you, you know, you had to fill out like a 20 page form and it's like, yeah, okay, let, let's streamline that. Let's, let's nudge that and make, turn exactly. it into a text. That's fine. But it, it, it's, it's not going to solve any type of major problem, especially an environmental Absolutely. one. Absolutely. So for a really good example of quite, so the, there's two broad things here, right? Maybe it's worth just spending a bit of time thinking about the two concepts. So not just simply, so some sort of a modification in the choice architecture and the choice architecture is basically just your decision context where mm. you make a choice, right? And the idea is to simplify that 
either through clever design, so physically, all right? An example of that would be don't have sweets at the checkout counter. That's a classic example, right? Mm. Don't have cigarettes at the checkout counter because those are temptation goods. Have something like fruits, right? Mm. So you feel like picking up an apple rather than, um, you know, a box of tobacco, whatever. Right. So that would be like an example of physical changing in, in, in the infrastructure and your choice decision, or it could be informational. So, for instance, put particular sorts of information, whether it's visual in on a tobacco pack. The classic example is a picture of lungs or it could be the way information is framed, um, what information is presented. So we spoke about like social comparisons, like what your neighbors do. Right. Those are all things that are supposed to nudge people, make it easier for them to pick the right thing rather unconsciously, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily about changing preferences. Right. Whereas your typical interventions, which ask people to do things, um, were often seen as educative nudges. So information campaigns, which try to persuade people by presenting them more and more information. Right. So often more and more and more information doesn't work. It, it exhausts people. They don't really pay attention to it. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't, essentially. So the argument was present simple, salient information, which gets the message across. Right. And, and the converse of that was. Actually, there are decision settings which are full of frictions, which make it quite hard for you to do the right thing. So simplify that. And that's kind of the idea of removing sludge. Mm. So an example of that, which we also talk about in the paper, is to apply for something like Green Homes Grant. The instructions on websites can be super clear, unclear. There might be many providers. There might be many steps. Immigration paperwork is an example of where there's a lot of sludge. Mm because there's explicitly like a hostile immigration policy. Yeah, and exactly. It makes it quite difficult to understand yeah. um, as someone who's done years of immigration paperwork, like yeah, yeah. with a PhD in two months, just like it was hard for me to do. So, you know, I can just imagine how, how much time that takes. So there's a time cost as well, apart from just the mental exhaustion of going through these things. So that those would be examples of things that create sort of an uncertainty cost, a psychological cost of friction. And that's typically what sludge would be. In some cases, actually, you do need to do the due diligence for good paperwork, right? So mm -hmm. sludge can be useful. But in many cases, to apply for Green, green Homes Grant, for instance, that shouldn't be the case. It should be simple. And that's where, for instance, there's a case to just simplify that process, and that could be a nudge. However, the fact is you still need a grant to insulate your home. You still need support mm -hmm. to do heat pumps installation in your home. Right. So that is still an incentive that the state is trying to provide homeowners to to help cut energy costs, but also to help reduce emissions from energy use. Right. So already in that example, you see how there's more than one policy instrument and how a nudge will not save the day. Yeah. yeah. Right? right. Because you're already trying to basically simplify a process where you can get help to, to improve your home and reduce the social negative externality to society from excess emissions or wasting energy in the home. I think there's also this issue as well, isn't there? And it, it, you raised it, especially with the immigration example, is like to, to frame this as a mistake, as a kind yeah. of technocratic mistake that these processes are very difficult um, is, is often to miss the point because they might be they might be very difficult for a reason um and that could be incompetence and lack of understanding in some cases yes. uh, but i think in in other cases it's actually it's actually quite deliberate and it kind of works for the people who are designing the policies right exactly and i think we've got the idea and i and i think there's two things here right i think you've brought this it's a really interesting point that you bring up there's two broad things right one is actually there's an intentional sludge built into particular processes which might help people to take more pro environmental decisions right and and that could be everything from city design to the fact that maybe there's an implicit assumption that actually you know, taking cars are better socially because it's 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 better for your status or something, right? So the way cities are built and so on, right? Um, rather than thinking, okay, let's start with a case where public transportation should be affordable, free, and everyone should be able to access it and use it, and there should be well interlinked transport networks, right? So there might be something there in terms of intentionally what's happening in the policy space, but there's also this idea that people are irrational and that's bad. <laughs> Right. That's not to say that people don't behave in ways that might run counter to their best interests in terms of they can be impulsive, but also the frame 
that people you start off as people are irrational and therefore some in in some way short i think puts a lot of responsibility implicitly onto individuals for what are really complex societal systematic issues for which we should have players at multiple entities working together you brought up Ostrom's work, right, um, at the beginning. So one of her ideas, for instance, is the idea of polycentric governance, which is the idea that individuals can come together to solve local environmental problems, but they feed into things like local government and advocacy groups, and that feeds into basically state, you know, higher provincial government, and governments have to therefore come to fix the issues that individuals themselves can't solve by setting incentives right in the market, and then Businesses also have to be compliant and held responsible and, and you know, you have to have long term plans and be accountable to government. So because we're in a multi level system with multiple players, not just individuals, nudges run the risk of sort of individualizing through the narrative of how they operate and the idea that individuals are responsible as one of the core, you know, you can help them be more responsible sort of narrative. There is this risk that you end up sort of not just depoliticizing and absolving higher entities from taking coordinated action to address the issue, but also transferring a lot of that guilt and load onto mm -hmm. individuals. Mm. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned climate change, right? Because it's like this idea of present bias, right? We are biased towards ourselves in the present. Now, in one way, that's one of the more robust findings from yeah. behavioral economics. It's pretty clear that we value the here and now. We have a bit of trouble to thinking about the future. We also have trouble thinking about probabilities and catastrophic catastrophic events like we you know i mean look yeah. at the pandemic we didn't really see it coming it we do have trouble with all those things that is true but it seems to me and you know going back to ostrom the salient question is really how do we design our governance structures exactly. such that we address those problems because while we and while we do have present bias we have multiple selves right and we have a political mind and i think if you ask most people you know do you want um Bangladesh to be completely underwater, they're going to be like, well, no, and I would be in favor of action which address that. But if the governance systems don't bring out that person, Absolutely. that self, and they, they more appeal to the the inaction, right, then you're going to observe more present bias. But it's really an artifact of how you've structured your governance, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think this is the key thing here when we think about, like, how do we think our way out of this? It is around how do you design institutions that respect, you know, both the freedom of individuals, but also not frame this as a trade-off because it is in people's interests in the long run. In the short run, it might not be, it might be a bit expensive or whatever, but in, in and, and that's where you need the state to come in and think through how to resolve that issue along with people, right? You have to take people with you. So I think some, when you, you know, often there are issues which are really interesting, right? For instance, NIMBYism, where people mm. would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm up for wind energy, but maybe not in my neighborhood. But recent studies also show that across, there's bipartisan support for grid renewable energy. But then the state needs to show up and capitalize on that bipartisan support and think about ways to do this, right? Yet we don't see resultant government action mm. also. So I think this is where we're sort of stuck, where actually we do need institutions to work with and bring out the best in our natures as well, which is this impulse to think long term. Also, the interest to hold multiple selves, like the impulse to cooperate, all those things do exist, but they need to be bought out in our institutional environments. And, and, and that's, I think, really where we need to see more thinking and more action. Mm. A really interesting case of this is actually when, <laughs> since since you're about unlearning economics as well. Um, so Robert Frank in, in the 90s, I think, but this has been replicated even in my PhD, I sort of replicated this finding, was when you have, um, you know, a typical lab experiment where you, where you call people into the room, into the lab, and you get them to take some decisions. Everyone's anonymous. There's no opportunities for interaction, right? And there's some sort of a commons dilemma. Could be a public goods game where you want to contribute to the public good and, and you know someone who's selfish which is the economic model would keep it and free ride in a commons dilemma you want to extract mm. right so that's the one i did you know we found that and and robert frank also finds this you know you have when when you have economists in the room they expect other people to act selfishly so their behavior sort of follows that belief expectation um and they contribute less mm. <laughs> because they're taught that that's 
what to do, yeah. right? And those are the incentives they face. So I think it's similar to that, right? So I think there is a role for education, but also sort of rethinking how we understand people and their potential to cooperate. Because our beliefs, if you believe that people will be selfish, then you behave in a way that fulfills that belief. Mm. And I think then you do get these sorts of institutions which reflect that belief as well, right? Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, I mean, in game theory for, for a long time, I think, and, and maybe still today, it has always assumed first that people are rational and selfish, but also it's very much focused on the outcomes um, of that behavior as opposed to the rules of the game. And it's yes. like, how did you set How did you set up the game? Because that's the question we need to be asking, right? How do you set up the game? And how it's do like, you set up the game? Yeah. And this is the issue that you brought up with Hardin's original tragedy of the commons as well, right? Mm. Where you do have, when you set up the game, you come in with with assumptions rather than, and, and, and often they're naive assumptions on what human nature is and what the rules of the game are. So you think of a common property resource, not as something that's governed by a group of people, but more sort of just lacking in private property rights. And mm. that's a particular lens to bring into it, mm. which then you will say, those are the rules of the game. And then when you have predictions which bear out the rules of the game, it does become a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And then when you do teach people that that's, basically what people do, then they are expected to do that as well yeah. in these setups. And that's kind of why I think we need we need to really think through who writes the rules of the game? Why do we have these rules? What happens when you have different rules? I mean, is he, our co-author Stuart Mills is actually in the chat, by the way. Um, <laughs> he, he sometimes joins. Uh, but yeah, Stuart also wrote, wrote, wrote this paper. But um, it's funny because he actually, I was actually going to mention him anyway, uh, because Stuart showed me uh, an article by Barack Obama, I think, or it might have been David Cameron, or maybe it was both of them together. It was in The Guardian in like 2011, right? Mm -hmm. Who was literally just kind of saying what we've been saying, right? So it's it kind of, you can risk sounding a bit conspiratorial in a way uh, when you say, you know, why are these systems designed this way, blah, blah, it's an excuse for governments. But if you read that article, whoever it was by, uh, one of the heads of, of, of state, it was like, it, it, he's literally saying it. He's like nudges nudges the way to basically take governance decisions without taking governance decisions to to avoid like these big questions. Well, that's not surprising because both Cameron and Obama were one of the first um, government heads to sort of introduce behavioral science and nudging officially into government and, and, and the operation of government, right? And the idea was at, at the time to not restrict freedoms. So the idea was to also maintain the status quo for those who want to maintain the status quo. Now, if you do go by the scientific advice, by the IPCC's recommendations, that you do need to transform the way we do economics, but we also have to transform our societal institutions. They call for deep transformations, essentially, which is not just a change in our market structures and, and the way we do business, but also in values and things, because that's needed. They're not like, it's not a one or the other. So if you do want those deep transformations, that does mean fundamentally changing the status quo. And in that sense, there will be lots of resistance from people who benefit from the status quo. That's just, again, basic economics, mm. right? Because, and we also, it's also basic behavioral science because you do know that people um, have a status quo bias. We do know, although the endowment effect doesn't generalize extremely well, there's also the tendency in some cases to, to fear, you know, what you lose from the current mm. state. So in terms of loss aversion and so on. So, you know, I think, I think in that sense, the idea of a nudge in essence is to give people the freedom to stick to the status quo, but that's not what you need for climate change. It, if you do go by the scientific advice, which is we need a systems transformation, then that's not going to cut it. It might be one of the things that you use along with other tools to really change the system over time and make sure people aren't left behind. Mm. But um, and that you take people with you because that's the other big issue, right? You mentioned the Gilets Jaunes protests. Yes. So if you don't really think about distributional concerns when doing this, I think you'll end up just polarizing people and and then disabling any change, which works out well for people who benefit from the system anyway. Stuart's corrected me. It was Thaler and Osborne together, apparently. So it wasn't either Barack Obama or David Cameron completely misremembered that. But Thaler and Osborne writing together, which is arguably even more interesting. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, no. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the, the democratic component comes into it as well, right, with the, something like the Gilets Jaunes protests. It's like, 
you have to take these big governance decisions, but you have to bring people with you. And I think if you're saying there's status quo bias, and like you said, there's some questions about how that generalizes. I think it depends on people's expectations, right, of like what's going to happen. I, I think you've got to show people an alternative, right? You've got to create a transformative alternative. If you're going to tell people don't drive your car, well, you can't just do that. You can't just say like either cars are banned or the price of petrol's doubled. If they if that's how they get around, you have to give yeah. them an alternative, right? Uh, of either walking, cycling, or public transport, um, yeah. or whatever else. Yeah, and I think this is basic when it comes to insights around habit formation and mm. creation, right? So, for instance, if you want to break a bad habit, you also have to put in place another habit instead. You can't just get people to break a bad habit. And the point of habits, for instance, is the context is stable and you repeat that behavior again and again. Transport's a really good case for this, especially if you look at things like commuting, right? Um, and, and you know, what happened in COVID was really a fundamental change in that context. So lots of people's commuting behaviors just changed, right? And that's what um, scholars like um, Vasvara Plankin, as well as Lorraine Rudmarsh would call like a transformative moment where the idea is like that this really changed the rules of the game in a sense people didn't have to go into work anymore um there were different risks from commuting um you know on public versus private transport and so on so you can have multiple effects there right some people might choose to just have more flexible work days work from home a lot more other people might actually choose to buy cars because they don't trust public transport if they were nervous or quite compromised other people might actually sell their cars because they don't need to go into work as much if you live in a city but none of this would work in a rural context where maybe you just have poor public networks of, mm. of transport, you know, unreliable trains and so on. So unless you make trains reliable and have a good rail network or a good bus network, in those sorts of cases, you can't, it's not reasonable to get people to not drive their cars because they're also used to it. Mm. Right. And it's also sort of feels unfair. So I think in those sorts of situations, this is another example where you can nudge people to reduce car use as much as possible, but it's just going to fall on deaf ears yeah. because there's no good alternative mm. or there's no feasible alternative, which people think is feasible and for good reason, right? Yeah. So I think in those sorts of situations, that can explain why, for instance, nudges will fail because you can't nudge people when there's no good alternative, mm. right? But it also is a good example of where you actually need big infrastructure investments, um, to to put those alternatives in place, potentially. Um, but if they're missing, <laughs> yeah, you I, get this you illusion know. of people being irresponsible or not doing the right thing because they're selfish when it's actually just quite a sensible thing to keep driving your car because what if you need to get somewhere for your kid's football or mm. you need to go to the hospital or you just need to do your shopping and there's no, yeah. The, the option's not there. I mean, I was speaking to Max Holler and the urban sociologist earlier this week, and we were chatting a lot about cities in America, and he was saying, look, okay, look, New York is a city, but actually a lot of cities in America are not. They're just massive, uh, sprawling suburbs connected by freeways. And how do you expect people to get around, especially since you're not allowed to build uh, shops near the houses either? Uh, it's just a suburban house and you need to drive for 10 minutes to get milk. It's like you can't you can't nudge people out of that. Like maybe and, and to be clear, in terms of designing policy, behavioral science can help you and nudge can help you. Right. It's like make the process simple, you know, make it easy um, and all the rest of it. But like, ultimately, it needs like resources, expertise, um, and and just a vision. Consult, and you need to consult with communities, right? Yep. So an example of even in London, where you've got like quite good public transportation, it, it might be an exception, really, to most cities in the world, right, where you've got good public transport networks, good buses, um, and so on. And but here, when you have new measures which are seen as pro-environmental, like low traffic neighborhoods, if it's not planned in consultation with local communities and their views are not taken on board, then you run the risk of, say, rerouting traffic and shifting pollution elsewhere or communities not fully buying it. And something which is a good idea on paper, it becomes a bad idea in practice or becomes resisted by the public in practice. And then that alienates people from actually a cause they might quite believe in and agree with. Mm. So I think there's also room for like consulting, not just experts, but also the public, because they, you need to understand how they actually use space, what they value from space. And, and I think that is a long deliberative process. Mm. <laughs> of, and that does require a bit of time and that does require intentional action. And you can't just nod away that, <laughs> you know? Absolutely.
But should we should, let's talk about um, climate denial because I think this relates to to yeah. the general um, picture we were painting. But one of our examples was was climate denial um, and uh, disinformation, right? And how behavioral science can help that. And the, this stuck in my mind really because we uncovered this paper from 1979, arguing that uh, behavioral scientists needed to cooperate with natural scientists to combat climate. Uh, disinformation. And so we've already had a go at behavioral science and economics and maybe some other stuff. But let's have a go at natural scientists now because they were very dismissive. And I think what we don't want to do here is be dismissive of behavioral science and social science in general. It's just the narrow application of nudge. Because natural scientists were like, well, no, climate change is real. Uh, we've got the facts on our side. We just need to write loads of papers and long reports, right? And then people will believe it. And then, you know, you have the whole history of climate denial is like natural scientists just having rings run around them on TV debates by like bad actors who are just really talented at, you know, rhetoric and all the rest of it, right? So, I mean, how do you think behavioral science can help us address this this kind of uh, disinformation? Because that's one role for it. Yeah, I think there's maybe two, three broad ways. So the first thing is, I think, one of the first early forms of climate denial took the form of basically, you know, disinformation campaigns that spread that climate change was not caused by humans. So it cast climate change as a natural phenomena. And often the the narrative there was that, listen, the climate's always changed in the history of the earth. And, you know, so the core bit of information that scientists brought to the table at that time was actually there's been an acceleration in global warming in a historically short period of time. The, the famous hockey graph is the mm. one that comes up here. And that is unnatural. And that's why it's attributed to human activity. And it's clearly linked to fossil fuel emissions post the Industrial Revolution and so on. Right. So I think this was the debate. So casting climate change as not anthropogenic, but as natural, absorbs people from action. And a lot of the times, I think one way to combat that is actually just correct the misinformation cognitively. So that does mean educating people and making sure that people know that this is actually attributed to humans. So some of my research, but also other research shows that actually when you attribute the causes correctly of the problem, it's important to inform the types of solutions you support. So if you attribute the cause of climate change, but also biodiversity loss and things to human action, whether that's pollution, land use change, and so on, that does mean you're able to support policies, but also take personal behavior change, or you're willing to do it, even if you don't, I haven't actually measured if people do it, but that's a big debate anyway, but you're willing to support behavioral change, which does speak to those root causes. But if you diagnose the cause wrong, then you absolve yourself from the responsibility. So if you see it as caused by a natural thing, then it's like, what can we do about it? A bit of fatalism creeps in, but also demobilization. And then you have a whole scale sort of disavowal of science and mistrust in science and so on. Now, a separate debate is why people trust and don't trust science, but we can leave that aside, right? So I think the first thing is actually to correct that misinformation. The second thing is also framing. So how you frame the issue. So most people sort of, you know, and 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 all these sort of framing, correcting misinformation, and cognitions, and so on, are small solutions to the problem, which are important for I think long term having an accurate understanding of what's going on, which is I think really important in a democratic society, but any society as well, right? Other ways I think, it, 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 you know, I think in in this in, this is where nudges are typically brought up because people are like, okay, there are, there are systematic ways you can you can say have inoculation against fake information. So train people to figure out how the information is fake. Um, and, and, and in that sense, you can basically try to think of misinformation or disinformation as a virus. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can figure out like how to immunize people against this. So behavioral scientists try to do a bit of research there as well. There have been effects which have been shown on things like intentions and beliefs. It's not clear how they generalize to behavior or, or if they generalize as well. So that's another way. So all of these are more sort of information campaigns and like framing and nudges and things. Um, apart from education campaigns, so proper science education in school, which is a lot more resource intensive and less nudgy, right? And then others would argue the way we should do this is just a clever design of institutions. Mm. So things like taxes, good mandates, holding companies to account. So climate litigation has come up 
a lot. So if you're found guilty of spreading misinformation or delaying climate change, then take it to the courts. Like that's another way entirely, which behavioral science has not said much about at all, but that is is happening mm. as well. Um, and, and, you know, this is where conversations about greenwashing and carbon washing um, and misleading investors and things will come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, is one of the really interesting things that came out of this debate is like how much, not just natural scientists, but academics co coach their language in uncertainty and sort of like, yeah, yeah, well, we, we think we know this, right? Whereas uh, people who are denying climate change are much more like, no, no, the climate's definitely not warming. It's definitely not due to human action. Like or this is a lie. Or they, or they sort of emphasize the uncertainty. Yeah. Right. So they sort of emphasize what's in the tales. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they emphasize mm. the uncertainty, which therefore increases the doubt you have in your mind that maybe the science has a consensus. So some another way of combating this from the behavioral science has been to emphasize the scientific consensus on this. So Naomi Oreskes' work does does a lot of this, where they sort of interview a lot of climate scientists or survey them and think about like what's the consensus in the science. And if you communicate that consensus, for instance, 99.7% or something of scientists sort of agree that climate change is, is happening and caused by humans, that sort of scientific consensus can induce greater confidence um, in the science, but also reduce that perception of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Something else which we do find is narratives of disinformation often present this two sides debate, where it's like, and it's very hard to combat this because it becomes like personalized narratives rather than scientific like evidence. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes like there was this one incident and this happened because an individual, for instance, went through this and, you know, um, and then there's this other perspective and this is what this other individual thinks. And, and we know that when we contend with multiple narratives, especially if they're personalized or rooted in two personalities, we tend to give equal weight to them and often remain ambiguous or confused or uncertain ourselves because you're like on the one hand, on the other hand, right? So often you'll find this information campaign sort of couching in these sorts of personalized narratives. And that often induces confusion in people as well. And that's quite difficult for the science to combat because the science is about like th this percentage confidence in this particular path or trajectory, one which of, is a lot yeah. more abstract. Difficult to I mean, one thing which springs to mind are these the more deliberative uh, democratic participatory forums, yeah. right? And I think Ireland's experimented with these quite a lot. And I think I'm pretty sure am I misremembering here? We had some climate assemblies as well. Yeah, there were some climate assemblies, right? And that tends to reduce denial. And I guess that's it's not personalized, is it? Because there's so many people, um, and but everyone has a say. Puts yeah, and it also puts scientists in, into conversations with people. Mm. So you often have a representative sample, in, in, you know, and, and that cuts across whatever parameters people putting together the participative, um, you know, sort of assembly, um, sort of it could be age, gender, ethnicity, political background, whatever, you know, depends on what um, the criteria are, but you have some sort of representative sample of people who come together, typically reflecting a diversity of opinions about an issue, um, and then you put them in touch with scientists and experts and, and they get to have a conversation, which is a sort of structured conversations over a number of days. The existing evidence sort of shows, I think, that people tend to actually reduce polarity. So like, if you know, polarization reduces. Um, however, I think there's a question as to what do you do with these findings? Um, what does the government do with these findings? Right. So if people do agree on a set of actions, how they're actually implemented is a separate thing. Um, and what that actually means for the governance of the problem itself might be a separate thing. But from the perspective of reducing disinformation and in reducing polarization, I think those can be effective. I mean, I, I try not to um, whinge about the media too much because everybody does it. But I suppose there is this question as well, going back to not just focusing on one, one aspect of the problem and trying to look at the bigger structures. I mean, is... Is there a sense in which this kind of disinformation is propagated more in a certain media environment, whether yeah. that's old corporate media or, to be honest, newer platforms, right, because you've had like quite a rise of disinformation there and sensationalism and clicks and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we started off with the older campaigns being mostly about denial around the cause, the human cause of climate change. Currently, it's often around delay. 
Mm. And what you see now, so things like gas is a clean alternative to coal. Mm. <laughs> it's still a fossil fuel, right? Yes. So, <laughs> I don't know how that happens. So, That's really so weird. It's a transition fuel. Yeah, right? yeah. So, you know, so you find these sorts of campaigns of delay which sort of like still sort of create this idea that, you know, uh, there was in the US, there was a campaign which was rampant on social media, which was around, you know, food tastes better with gas. So people were refusing to move to electric stoves because they thought food was tastier when cooked with gas. But that was put up by a gas lobby, I think, (laughs) or fossil fuel lobby. So, you know, you've got like these sorts of interesting disinformation campaigns which diffuse through social media in particular ways. And it's very difficult to tell with corporate media or legacy media, you know, okay, these are the people who own the paper or this this is the editorial line that you're willing to take. There's a bit more transparency there. But when you you don't know which influencer is being paid for what, so it's quite difficult. And there's a different level of trust on social media. And we spoke about personal narratives. That's quite compelling on social media because you want to give people the benefit of doubt. So um, apart from things like algorithms feeding you information you've already selected and so on. So in terms of the scope for disinformation to spread, my understanding is it, there's a potential for it to be much higher on social media. But legacy media has a really strong role in the sense of being able to already be credible messengers who actually spread a lot of information in, in one sense. But the idea that we can choose our information and mime and increasingly and personalize it to our own interests, I think gets away from this idea of, you know, we all have a right to believe what we want to believe, but... You know, yeah. it goes towards that sort of like we can create our realities and it sort of fits into this whole like the commodification of the self in a, in a way, right? Yeah, Where you, individualized. You, individualized. As, yeah. as the leader of the cult of unlearning economics, <laughs> whose, whose followers do his bidding, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I'm very familiar with this. But I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a big problem, right? And I, I don't really stoke the parasocial relationship uh, with my followers, it still exists because it's, it's inevitable. Um, and it's, it's okay, but it's just like some online personalities are just like, they literally lean into that so much. And I, I, you know, you wonder, especially in America, if they would actually, uh, engage in violence for them, (laughs) you know, they literally follow them that strongly. Yeah. I think there, there's definitely a big question as to how much behavior on social media influences behavior in the real world. Um, I think in some cases, like voting behaviors and, and, you know, big public information campaigns, there is scientific evidence that it does. So they've done some evaluations of things like Facebook, Facebook campaign um, evaluations and stuff and, and found that actually the amount of money you spend does influence, um, you know, the amount of people who you vote and the type of nudging you do on that mm. environment does influence that. Um, in smaller scale studies that we've done, we haven't really seen a clear mapping, but when you think about it, but that might be because we've done one shot studies where we've not looked at the long term effects on behavior. If you think about people selecting repeatedly into the same information environment and changing their beliefs slowly over time, that could be quite different and quite profound. Mm. Um, there was another, I forgot what paper it was, but there was also another paper which talked about how often in, in things like football matches, you often met people from the other side, or when people use public transport, you often were forced to contend with people who are quite different from you. Yeah. And that induces a separate sort of understanding and and conversational capacity as well as willingness to to exist with difference. Whereas if you have increasingly personalized bubbles where people are not opting into information environments, which you sort of challenge or which are diverse, that changes the capacity to tolerate difference as well. I don't know about the scientific evidence for a lot of this stuff, but it's just interesting to think through what does it mean if we are increasingly in bubbles and and those bubbles present us with misinformation, which is increasingly difficult for us to de- decipher anyway, because mm. you're so comfortable in that bubble. Because we do know that there is information avoidance. People do avoid information that makes them uncomfortable. That's definitely something that we have to contend with in the climate change space. So, yeah, I think this is a really important sludge in a way that we framed it in the paper. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I mean, it the... On, sort of online online politics is like is just like such a I think a caricature of like how these real interactions that you were talking about uh, on on the train or at a football match might go right and I think it's just like I mean while I love memes I do 
I do sometimes wonder if like everything's just being reduced to memes and there's not really <laughs> all people do is just I mean I don't know you're you're a bit less active online than I am right but it's like I I just all people do is just meme and they just quip right and it's like that that's that's not how normal people have conversations right <laughs> it's like it's like it's really really harmful and I think it's just like completely siloed information and it's a new type of disinformation right so maybe even that which we identified in the paper because i guess we were talking more about the kind of legacy media and the corporate stuff right but it, it's it's just changing so fast and i mean we i don't know up, how to we bring it. up this yeah we bring up this interesting idea of moral wiggle room which is the idea that when you've got competing bits of information or competing contextual mm. If you have the option to sort of opt out a little bit from being good, which in a way that's costly to you, you're able to sometimes exploit it to avoid taking the expensive personally, mm. you know, pro environmental action, right? So, you know, I think what in misinformation and disinformation do is allow us to pull at these sorts of, whether it's a funny meme you saw, you feel good about yourself and then you like sort of absolve <laughs> yourself from response where you could say like, oh, but other people are like this or oh, that's just the way the world is or whatever, right? Like, so I think in a way, it's important to also some sometimes like abstract a bit from those information environments to really, you know, because it's also like fast paced, isn't it? So yeah, it's so fast. I mean, you, I've, yeah. I always, when I, I've, I deleted my Twitter, but I remember the phenomenon of logging into Twitter and yeah. just having to backwards induce what had actually happened because there were already five layers of irony over mm. it. And I literally, I was just like, what, what's hap what's actually happened originally? I don't even know it, like, because the jokes are so, like, ironic and thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, think, I think this is also really interesting, right? Because it does feel, feed some sort of need for community and belonging. And, and in, in relation to disinformation, that's how you do get, for instance, particular online communities providing a lot of meaning to people, especially in circumstances where things can be quite hard. Mm. Right. Um, and, you know, COVID, it's difficult to meet people. But now, even if it is, there are, there are sort of these habits which are formed. And I think in, in you know, I'm thinking about like conspiracy groups like Flat Earthers and, you know, so in, in that sense, actually being in, in feeling like you're part of an inside joke through the meme upon a meme upon a meme, mm. I think does give people a lot of sense of belonging and meaning, which they might not be getting from physical spaces in the mm. same way or, you know. And I think that's another issue, which is why we were talking about, say, deliberated forms of engagement and greater community interaction and face-to-face -face interaction. It's not like those impulses are not there in face-to-face -face interaction. I think they just take on a slightly accelerated form in online spaces because things move quite quickly and there's quite like quite a lot of feedback and there's so much anonymization. Yeah. So a lack of face to face interaction just it's just completely different. I mean, I, I was I was reading about um, the decline of third spaces, right, which goes back to this idea of um, not necessarily brown infrastructure, but like just how nudge doesn't necessarily help when you don't have the, the choices, you don't have the physical spaces available um, and just like libraries or, or something like that, where you actually go and meet people and now people do it online. Right. And it's, it's much more toxic than going to a library. Libraries are notoriously not toxic places. Right. And you can go and speak to people who are different to you and who disagree with you and so on. Yeah. I think libraries, but also green spaces. Yeah. Um, is you know we we have to have like good investment in accessible green spaces um, because that's where people can access nature and and there are huge well-being benefits from that. But if you do have badly maintained parks or parks shutting down or not being well lit and things, these are just psychological factors which might put people off. Um, and you know there's there's one way that you know some there's a debate about whether you can use things like nature documentaries and virtual reality and stuff to connect people to nature um but but there's also the it, these sorts of initiatives coexist side by side along with stats showing that people are increasingly biophobic <laughs> because they don't interact with many animals but or th that means they actually don't like they fear, fear the environment nature. and like touching so, a, a tree or something yeah <laughs> touching a tree might be less threatening uh, but <laughs> things like yeah but basically the idea that spending out time in nature is sort of unnatural in a way that it like you get yeah. you get scared or it's too unpleasant or it's uncomfortable so the idea that actually more and more time on tech can can actually turn people away from this what people initially thought was sort of an impulse to nature right 
Um, and, and we think of ourselves as quite separate from nature in the in in some settings not in all like I think a lot of um cultures which um are indigenous really question nature human duality but I think at least in these sorts of sort of more western weird contexts western industrialized rich democratic countries you think of more sort of humans versus nature sort of setup but the idea of biophilia was that we have this innate connection with nature because we are part of nature and so on but now we're seeing with greater sort of time spent indoors, especially on things like technology, biophobia might also be a reality where people are actually put off from spending time. And that increasing disconnection does mean that people are willing to spend less resources and less personal effort in, in you know, protecting nature and doing things about climate change and biodiversity loss. Mm. So biophobia. I think a lot of, yeah. I, had, yeah. I didn't know that term, biophobia or biophilia. That's really interesting. I, t- I think mm. it, it resonates. Two Japanese scholars, Soga and Gaston, have done a bit of work on this. So for those interested, that would be an interesting place to start. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, so, I mean, to, just to, to place everything in context, I know we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole with, with misinformation and the media and stuff, but what we're exploring really, because th- this conversation is about the limitations of green nudges, uh, small changes in how choices are presented to people that can can hopefully alter their behavior and improve the environment and combat climate change um and this is just really limited because there's just such a sea of uh restrictions barriers impediments uh physical infrastructure uh that gets in the way of these kinds of behaviors which we call brown sludge right and and one of these is this disinformation and misinformation and it just it, it behavioral science and psychology uh more broadly can help with this a lot i think and i, I want because there's this there's this um there's a lot of research into beliefs right yeah. and that, that's what we've been touching on here really uh but we, we've we've kind of um looked into this and taught it right and i think there was again i i kind of i get a bit frustrated because there was this whole thing about confirmation bias everybody knows what confirmation bias is right we we seek out um uh information that that agrees with us we dismiss information that that doesn't and you just you mentioned it there or you alluded to it it's real but i think there was this again this approach to it where like oh it's like people are individually biased so how can we kind of deconfirmation bias them, uh, perhaps with some kind of in, in, intervention? And I think there was this this lack of understanding for why people why do people not change their beliefs in when they're given one piece of information? There might actually be quite good reason for that. If you change your beliefs every time you're given some new information, then you won't have any beliefs, right? And if you don't have any beliefs, then I don't, you can't really function, right? As a, to be honest, right? So there's this whole interdependence of beliefs which is quite an interesting research area and i think there's active research there yeah. and yeah so so i mean uh, what 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 do you what do you think of that do you, you recognize that area yeah it's interesting i think there i don't know much about this research area but i think there is an idea that actually beliefs are layered on top of networks of other beliefs that you already have mm. and some of them might be really important to your sense of self so your identity and and things and so on which is where i think Things like online communities and networks can give people that sense of identity mm. and community, whether it's an incel group or, you know, yeah. flat earthers in some cases, but also if it's on learning economics community, right? Like, <laughs> so <laughs> in, in a sense, like there is something there, which, you know, there's, you know, I think there is, there's a form of, so the reason, one reason that people are hesitant to give up these beliefs is also those social relationships is what I'm trying to say or the social benefits that you're getting from holding those beliefs. So, and in in that sense, I think that can be quite difficult to nudge away because how are you going to substitute social networks, Mm. (laughs) right? Because those do depend on interactions and often those are self-selecting in the sense that people select into those sorts of interactions, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's just, it's just these, these much deeper, problems which to be honest let's let's be fair the social psychologists who are in our department would say we were already asking these questions and then you came along with behavioral science and nudge and now you're gradually rediscovering that you have to uh, ask the same questions we've been asking for decades i think so and i and i have a lot of sympathy for that because <laughs> <laughs> i'm like yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i got i can't really yeah they're right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think, but this is where I think maybe one of the things that behavioral science, I'm not trying to 
put a flag up for behavioral science, but I think this is one of the things that behavioral science explicitly tries to do, which might be implicit or less of a focus on is this link to actual behavior, right? So what does yeah. this mean for decision-making in the real world, right? So I think in a sense that like people have looked at beliefs and confirmation bias and, and the structure of network beliefs and so on for, for a while, but um, often there might have been a conflation with intentions and actual behavior, or there might have been a conflation with attitudes and intentions and behavior, right? So something I think behavioral science and maybe people disagree and, and that's okay as well. But I think there is this explicit focus on actually, but what does this mean for real world choices? And, and typically what that means is using some sort of a field experiment or a randomized control trial to look at that causal effect on those choices. I think that's one of the things behavioral science brings in with a particular flavor. Yeah, There's a whole bunch of limitations with that way of thinking, yeah. right? Because just because you behave, measure behavior at one point in time doesn't mean that it's going to persist. Um, just because not everyone can do an RCT. Some cases it's quite difficult mm. to do an RCT and RCTs miss out a lot of things as well because you're forced to focus on a couple of things rather than the process of change. So there's a whole bunch of concerns around just relying on that methodology, but that's typically something which I think a lot of behavioral scientists might flag as what their contributions have been. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, that's uh, even if people may disagree, it's, it's probably the best defense of behavioral science that's out there, right? And it's, it's in it's in the name. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't damning with faint praise, by the way. I, I really liked yeah. it as a as a defense of behavioral science because yeah, it's it's focused on behavior, and it was behavioral science really was the. I mean, behavioral economics was the intersection of economics and psychology, and now it's kind of mutated into behavioral science which is maybe even more interdisciplinary but that's the thing that was the limitation of this kind of psychology right i think psychologists naturally were very focused on the mind what people think you know what what they believe how they feel um whereas economists were just like well we're just focused on behavior uh but obviously their oh, models they would were use very the limited term revealed preferences exactly yeah right which is really interesting because psychologists don't have a mm. construct like preferences they have beliefs they have affect they have emotions they have attitudes but preferences don't mean anything in terms of a ranking mm. like <laughs> but economists really do cling to the idea that their people might have ranked preferences and they enact those preferences and that means there's this revealed choice and you know there's um I'm, I'm a bit rusty on that literature but there is this question about what preferences are in terms of revealed versus stated and you stated. Know. yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's uh, put your money where your mouth is right or actions speak louder than words actually is a better saying yeah yeah but then the idea there is there's some sort of conscious process linking preferences to to choices mm. right because they're revealed um i think a lot of psychologists might i'm not going to speak as i'm speaking as someone who's interdisciplinary and that's my understanding but my understanding so i'm going to caveat that but um my understanding there is actually People can do things and then have some sort of a narrative justifying why they did it. And that might not be because they have a, a strong, clear preference about it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, I always so think about... you're so, on shaky ground yeah. <laughs> with the notion of preferences being revealed. Yeah. I mean, like 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 we said at the beginning of the um, conversation, right? You could think about like our careers and our paths through different disciplines and it's quite easy to look back on that and be like well this is the reason that I did so many different things right and it's like perhaps I could have got I mean you said you could have become a zoologist right perhaps with yeah, a roll I of the dice why I didn't yeah. <laughs> 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 I've just been at the bottom of the ocean somewhere studying some, I don't know, fish. Is, but, that, yeah. is that does that sound appealing to you? That sounds horrible to me. It does. It I think does. I'm biophobic. Then I, that's, <laughs> that sounds so scary. I've all tried scuba diving and I couldn't do it. All this time you spent on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. It, is. it literally is. Yeah. I, yeah. It's really, you've got me. I'm going to go through an existential crisis about my biophobia now. Uh, <laughs> now that you've introduced the term, you've got some plants at the back. That's some good. Like, yeah, yeah. I've got quite a lot of plants, but that. That's different. They're very contained and commodified, aren't they? The plants, right? It's like it's not actual nature. Um, not yeah. naming them to, to have a more personal relationship. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, in, so first, how long have I got you for? Because we've gone for over an hour now. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm okay, actually. You're okay. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. let let me ask you a very pointed Depends question. Depends on how bored people are. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People, I mean, to be honest, the amount of people watching has only gone up. We're on 150 now, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's. I think people are okay. Um, some somebody mentioned degrowth, which I might ask you about in a second. But yeah. 
Um, let me ask you a very pointed question, which may get you into trouble. Yeah. Are nudges basically a failed paradigm? Are nudges a failed paradigm? In the context of environmental climate change stuff, I think solely relying on nudges is a failed paradigm, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's yes. It, that's it. <laughs> that's so that was a, that was a very equi uh, unequivocal statement. Yeah, because I mean, I, yeah, and and I think that for two reasons, right? One is if you're looking at this as the single shot silver bullet to the issue, that's not going to work, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't work um, because I I think even in its original formulation, I wouldn't say even the most staunch sort of nudge theorists would argue that you do need other interventions because they might look at this as a case of market failure. And when you think about climate change as a case of market failure, you might have, people have issues with that paradigm as well. So I'm not advocating that paradigm. I'm just saying like, even the most hardcore economists would mostly argue for, and even the nudge theorists would mostly argue for multiple interventions, not just nudges. So I'm saying even as someone who's quite firmly, someone who might be firmly couched in the nudge literature might actually think that they would not work, be enough the reason I say it's a sort of failed paradigm is if they're thought to the exclusion or thought as a silver bullet and as the easy way out, they're not. Mm -hmm. And I think they can be quite distracting and they can also put into, they might also perpetuate unintentionally or intentionally sort of views that this is an issue that can be solved by individual responsibility, which is not the case. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting because we nudge, itself um and i know both you and i listen to the podcast if books could kill uh it, it is an airport book and look richard thaler and cass sunstein are both very prolific and serious academics who have done produced a lot of really interesting work and um that was the basis for the book right but nudge itself it, you know it was this kind of airport book and it, it was you know a neat idea here this one this one cool trick solves everything there was some dubious studies in it which i think I mean, there was one, there's that, that one about like you're putting a fly on you, the urinal reduces, uh, the amount of spray by 80%. And it's like, what, where did you get that from? Who gathered this data? Was it, was it at the Bergheim in Berlin? Because like, I don't, I just can't envisage what that, that lab experiment. Wait, wasn't it in Amsterdam? I mean, I don't even know I, why. I can't. My I, brain has retained this bit of information. Yeah. It, it was in Amsterdam. Eject, eject. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> i think so maybe it's wrong maybe uh, i'm wrong I, I but i just i just i mean i cannot believe that that you could ever find that out uh but um you know and and it, it just it, it became a bit too much of a neat idea and you and i have both taught you know executive students and i think one of the things that as i taught the course for more and more years i increasingly tried to hammer out of them was that nudge is this one neat trick that solves everything because that's the mentality they come in with. And you're like, no, look, most nudges don't replicate. The effect sizes are really small. Behavioral science is so much more than that, or it can be. Yes. And I think a lot of people would argue that actually behavioral science interventions are not about nudging. That's a particular form which has come from, say, we're talking about Thaler and Sunstein's nudge, that comes from the space of libertarian paternalism, mm. which is a framework which says that actually we need to, you know, have put, you know, this is a third way, right? Um, one that allows people to stick to the status quo. That's slightly different from, you know, uh, most environmental economists, for instance, would say that you've got to fix the market. And that means price incentives and price incentives are more effective potentially implicitly, even if they don't say it, it's implicit, than regulation, right? Which is most paternalistic, right? So I would say that actually, what we're and what we're actually facing with and most psycho, maybe more behavioral and psychological science people would say actually but we've got a whole range of interventions which are not which are rooted in psychological theory which are not nudges and we need to use all of them so for instance if you're talking about individual responsibility you have things like commitment devices you've got goal setting you've got um you've got pledges you've got like social commitments you've got like a whole range of issues and, and devices where you can help individuals achieve their goals, both individually and collectively. You've got deliberative, like maybe typically this is not seen as a psychological intervention, but this is how I teach it in my course. You've got deliberative forms. We've been talking about citizens' mm -hmm. assemblies, which will have an impact on behavior, 
You know, you've got hardcore education, environmental education campaigns, getting people to spend time in nature. You've got other ways of volunteering, like citizens assemblies, which will have its own knock on effects on behavior. So I think from that perspective, you've got a range of interventions and there's room to infuse all of them with psychological and behavioral insights and to really assess whether they have long-term effects on behavior. And not just, it's just one thing. And, and it's a good thing. Simplification mm. is good. Like, you know, removing frictions where they need to be removed is good. It's not, it's, it's not redundant as an idea, mm. but it's not your silver bullet. And it's definitely not going to address climate change because that's just ridiculous. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I, th I think w one of the contributions of Nudge, just to give it a, a roundabout defense, I think, was when I first read it, and bear in mind, I was like, I don't know, 18 or something. But when I first read it, it did completely change my conception of choice. Mm. And I think it really, it's the way it reframed choice was really interesting and valuable, because this idea of like, choices are always presented to us in a certain way. There's no neutral choice right because there's this this paradigm it's very popular in, in mainstream economics but also i think it's culturally uh really prevalent especially in anglo-american countries where it's like well people can make their decisions right and it's like well actually what nudge tells you is that people always make their decisions in a context and that can be everything from whether the suites are at the <laughs> at the counter where they pay to the broader social context right and the information and the beliefs they have and i think that's a really valuable way that's how i think about nudge now rather than just a narrow set of specific interventions so. but if you really pull that to its logical conclusion then you do think about who sets that context mm. and who designs that context and why is it not neutral Right. And, and I think the idea that maybe people have the freedom to choose might be a bit limited because it's not the case that everyone has the freedom to choose. Yeah. And it might be a comforting thought to think that might be the case. But if you do believe in the fact that contexts are not neutral and they are designed in a particular way, then you also have to think about how your choice is determined and how do you get that power back to reclaim the choices or design the environment that you want, which you think is good for society, right? Or you think is good for yourself and then society, whichever way that you want to sort of frame that. And I think this is where it, it becomes less about, oh, but I have the freedom to do yoga and then recycle and then go to the park and jog. Like, then it becomes less about your individual choice, but also you exerting that social responsibility to help design that system in a way whether it's exercising your power to vote or being involved in your local community groups, because if you want to really address climate change, there is this collective dimension. And then, you know, I think you then it does mean that you have to take that power back and then think about, okay, how, how should we do this? <laughs> and then you have to move from an I to we sort of set up in your mind because you know you're, you're not going to change your neighborhood by yourself, right? And, mm. and, and the way that I think is, is an important sort of switch to make and then you could either, you know, sort of delegate that power to some party that you want in a typical sort of voting democracy sort of setup. Or if you want to get involved with local community and do things there and build a sense of community there, I think that's another way to do it. There are many ways to do it. I think when, when we think about what to do about climate change, I often want to sort of emphasize that actually there's a lot that we can do. It's not that you're, you know, this should, the fact that there's no neutral context and you don't have the freedom of choice shouldn't necessarily or freedom of choice can be a bit of a you know a blinkered view it, it should open up the things that you can do rather than close them down right because it does mean that you can open up a bunch of actions that you can do you can do all the things that you know whether it's your diet change or your, your choice of travel to the way you spend time thinking about politics or who you want to vote for to the way you get involved in local community because that means you do have the power to change your context in a way hmm. because it's not neutral so that means you should take ownership of that, I think, a bit. It's, I mean, this it, it comes back to this question of just of governance, right, which is kind of obsessing me at the moment because, I don't know, I feel like we I don't really... We are, have Stuart. You, you, sorry, what do you say? This is why we, it's good we have Stuart. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Tell us what to do about that. Yeah, 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 exactly. I definitely need to talk to Stuart, uh, and I will do it at some point. But, yeah, he's got... I mean, it's, yeah, it's just how... We, we we don't I don't know we don't talk we don't think about governance really um, I think a lot of from the economy um, you know through to to other areas right there's this very hands off approach and I guess a kind of denial of social responsibility and how interconnected we all are because I you know even the basic economic theory says externalities need to be corrected 
But I think the problem is that it doesn't necessarily recognize that externalities, I mean, they're just the norm. Like literally everything you do affects other people. And that's why you can't just have a tax on every externality and a, um, or, or, a, or, or a subsidy for a, um, a, a positive externality, right? It's like, it's, it's much more complex than that. We all affect each other constantly and the future, uh, people nearby, people far away. And we need to design governance structures in, in the vein of Ostrom, right? That actually deal with that reality. And unfortunately, that's not a simple or sexy proposal like Nudge was. It doesn't, you know, it's not neat. It's not an airport book. It's actually probably quite tedious, <laughs> right? But it that's the tedious. truth. That's the truth. And I think that if, I think, when yeah it, i can't i can't disagree with that because i think it is the case that actually this does require actually sitting down and doing things and working together and trying different solutions but also learning from those that fail and those that don't so you have to have some sort of an implementation evaluation culture within that organization mm -hmm. and to do it um but that's also quite difficult for people because they have to work there's a cost of living crisis you know you have to take time out to do this people might not know where to start so i think you know, there are good constraints that people face, which, you know, put limits on how much time they can devote for these things. So something I'm increasingly interested in studying on these sorts of time constraints rather than just money constraints, which also exists. But I think those sorts of time constraints are things where you can have a role for policy to sort of explore, right? Because those time constraints vary by different groups. Something else which is really interesting is basically um, the idea of limitarianism, which is basically limits on potential wealth and accumulation so how much how many billions do you need to be happy or how many billions do you need to <laughs> because those things also do mean if, if you have excess power you also have excess power not just in the marketplace but also in politics so the capacity for people to influ influence particular policy regimes which have direct implications for climate change also hinge on your your monetary power so you know so i think there there are ways that you know we should be able to think beyond um, you know, just this individual responsibility, but also this idea of like, how do different groups in society operate? How do you put, how do you put a check on these limits and things which, which are really interesting, which, which need to, I think, come into the agenda a bit more. Elon, Elon Musk is uh, actually single-handedly settling the age old question of whether money can buy you happiness, because despite being the uh, second richest man in the world, uh, did you see that he, it was just revealed in court uh, that he made alternative quit Twitter accounts that praise himself? So he like posts underneath and he's like uh, about his divorce and stuff and how he's winning his divorce. And it's like money really doesn't buy you happiness. Like I'm sure a lot of very poor people this, are much happier than him. We do know this as well from the data, right, that it does flatten after a point. So mm -hmm. money does help um to an extent, but then after a point, and this is where the often one debate is like, what is that point and what is, but I think even if we don't think about what is the point at which that curve flattens where you've got basically well-being and then money on one side, just to think of the extremes mm. and think about actually what is, how do, how is money acquired at those extremes and how can you repurpose that money um, towards actually addressing some of these societal issues I think it's really important. I think what's not in dispute is that the gain for poorer people is just completely massively outweighs any gain for richer people, even if there's a slight gradient, right? Um, and also, I think one other thing which come out of that literature is the importance of social comparisons that everyone agrees, right? That in a richer country where you're, you know, you're not destitute, uh, really a lot of your enjoyment of your income comes from participating in society and being, you know, comparing yourself to those around you. Uh, and so that's, again, something that can change. If you change the income distribution, you change that. You change people's expectations and their reference points. I think Veblen, I mean, mm. in his work about conspicuous consumption, like spoke about this mm. a while ago, right? The idea that actually conspicuous consumption means no one's ever going to be very happy because you're always going to look at the reference point above you. <laughs> Mm, yeah. and, you know who's got a bigger yacht <laughs> mm. other than you know and and that's because we compare ourselves all the time so i think there is a case for and i think that this stage of hyper you know consumption that we're in i think that's kind of the direction and aspiration um which is not really good for climate change to be honest because yeah. it's a never-ending cycle i know there was a, a thing about degrowth but um mm. yeah i think that that definitely feeds into that conversation yeah I mean, I've, 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 um, 
talked about planned obsolescence on this channel, right? Because it's a really interesting case where things that we own just have objectively kind of gotten worse in, in terms of durability um, yeah. and quality and we don't really repair and uh, repair stuff anymore. You know, we just buy new stuff. Often often it's cheaper. Often it's not available. Uh, the, the possibility of repairing, like you actually physically can't repair a lot of smartphones. Like the you can't get the bits. You, you don't know the instructions, right? Uh, Apple or whoever don't provide you with the information, right? And they've been sued for that reason. But it's like the, the whole environment is just set up to encourage us to buy something more and and often frequently replace our smartphones every year, every couple of years, right? Um, and it's just a massive problem. And not only is it obviously bad for the environment because e-waste is just a huge problem, yeah. um, it really affects us as well. And I think the, sort of psychologically, uh, we, we have really horrible relationships with, for example, our phones, right? Um, whereas if you imagine like somebody who has a, a really old phone that they've repaired loads of, loads of times, right. They might actually have a better relationship with it psychologically dumb too. Phones now, I think. What's yeah. that? They call them dumb phones. Dumb now, phones. Yeah, exactly. Dumb phones. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, it's, it's a whole social shift that, that we need. Right. Yeah. I think there is a movement towards voluntary simplicity in some circles, but also towards like dumbing down your phone and spending less time on it. I think those things are happening, but they're sort of happening in pockets. I think when we think about actually, there is a need to sort of combine those and mainstream those approaches in some sense, or at least have a greater conversation about the benefits of those approaches and why people are doing it. Something that people do pay attention to from a behavioral perspective is why people do things, not just what they do. For instance, we did an experiment where we found that the motivation matters, not just the social norm. <laughs> so the social paying attention to the social norm would be things like why people do it or whether the other people think they ought to do it. Whereas the motivation is, is it nice to do? Is it fun to do? Am I having a good time doing it? Is this for the environment? And often that's the entire intuition behind likes, for instance. Mm. So um, I think when when you think about well-being, and you're thinking about actually people are happier without this. That might be a more convincing argument <laughs> than you ought to do it yeah. or people are doing it. So I think actually profiling more stories and, and, and mainstreaming those ideas, because a lot of this experimentation is happening on the ground. It's just that often they just don't get the airspace or time. Mm. So I think in a way it's limit. You could use social media for this sort of stuff, but it has to sort of compete with other information like, Elon Musk's multiple accounts. But <laughs> but my point being like actually profiling and mainstreaming those stories is, is an important place to start mm. and sharing those experience and those experiments as well. Because it does show that a lot of people are trying to do things on the ground. It's just that maybe they just don't get the airtime the same mm. way. Is the, it, go, it goes back to the, uh, if there's if there's no dancing at the revolution, then I'm not coming, right? It's that type of thing. Um, I mean, and speaking of uh, probably good ideas that, have kind of bad names let's let's talk about degrowth directly because um i mean you, you kind of hinted that you're something of a degrowther uh so how do you see it and what does it mean yeah i mean the so one of my phd students um dallas Udell, she's doing work on degrowth and we were basically looking at what is the link between more macro perspectives on degrowth which talks about gdp and decoupling and things and what does that actually mean from a behavioral perspective so for instance, um, and, and and my other colleague, Fred Basso, who, who you also, mm -hmm. obviously know, he, he's involved a bit more. So actually Fred and Dallas are a bit more in that world. Um, but what we found was actually people don't often differentiate when we use more sort of degrowth and, and green growth sort of messaging. So we found that people, whether you talk about degrowth or green growth from a consumption point of view, people have the intention to reduce, but you know, it's not about, yeah. So. So I think often at, at, a, at a baseline consumption level, often people don't differentiate between these two. But I think that you're right that, that degrowth does have a bad name. So I think some of Fred works, for instance, tries to look at actually reframing that and whether that is more appealing to people, for instance. Um, I think I think the the what is the question though? Is the question like what is my position on degrowth, or yeah. is the position yeah? Yeah, I mean, I suppose yes. I, the the sort of pre question to that was how do you see degrowth, right? Because as you as we we're getting at, it, can't, it sometimes means different things to different people, right? Yeah. And so, what's your version of degrowth? I suppose. Yeah, I think the idea that infinite growth is possible 
is not credible <laughs> just because we will come against resource limits, but also growth as a principle by which we should organize society and policy is not as compelling to me as, as I think it's, it's not the most attractive way to organize society mm -hmm. because there's no automatic trickle down. And the idea of decoupling is also quite difficult to think about when we come up against hard limits and, and scientific predictions. Um, you know, and also the fact that often when we, we we do think about someone told me like 2050 is closer than 1990. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I bring up 2050 just because 2050 is when we have quite direct climate predictions coming yeah. up. Right. Um, and we're seeing a lot of wildfires and things recently. And we're also seeing a lot of climate anxiety amongst people who are younger. Um, and, and those are real issues, right? When we're thinking about resources, but we're also thinking about the well-being effects and, and how growth has actually served people recently. So I think from that perspective, I don't think growth should be and is a good organizing principle for society, right? That said, I do think that in particular places where you do have poverty and you do have things like energy poverty, growth is essential. So I think a lot of degrowth scholars would also say that we're mostly talking about affluent nations where you've got overconsumption yeah. rather than actually mitigating growth for poorer countries or populations while recognizing there's a huge inequality within countries as well, <laughs> right? So someone who's ultra rich in say my, in India and someone who's ultra rich here are more similar than someone who's, you know. Yeah. So I think that's something which is really important to come up against. But the idea that actually we should shift towards broader social foundations. I know you had Kate Rolworth on, for instance. Yeah. I think basically thinking about a different way to organize society which decenters growth is something that's really appealing to me. And the idea that overconsumption is actually pretty empirically we know, like the, the data shows it's not good for well-being. It's not necessarily good for the environment. So from that perspective, I don't think the economic principle of more is better. <laughs> Mm. I think that's not compelling either. So I think from that perspective, I have a lot of sympathy for degrowth. Um, it just has a lot of, it's just not as widely accepted. And I think operationalizing it at the individual level, like what that means for people is something which is interesting to me. It could be things like repair, reuse, yeah. right? In terms of actual behavioral decisions. Um, but also perceptions of degrowth and what that means for policy. So my work, another paper we've got with Dallas shows that actually there's a lot of um, support for some degrowth policies in the US, which could be things like universal healthcare. It yeah. could be things like a four day work week and things like that. Um, so those could be seen as degrowth policies. Something else which actually comes to mind is when we, there's some work by Dan O'Neill, which shows that actually degrowth, green growth and other sorts of Policies, there's some overlap in a lot of policies, which mean there's already space for people to start, you know, implementing things where there's a lot of agreement. And I think I have a lot of empathy for that argument. Mm. Like energy efficiency, things like renewables, there's already quite wide support across the board, irrespective of your position, that those are the policies that need enacting. Mm. If you if you say things to people like, you know, classic degrowth policies moving towards renewables being the most obvious one right uh less car centric cities more public transport more also cycling social equality right so social things equality like, yeah things like actually having a working nhs for instance that would yeah. be seen as a package of degrowth policies right mm. things like actually having access to good quality education because you need the social foundations to have a good environmental foundation too mm. so i think I think a lot of you talked about framing and getting a bad name. I think when you think about degrowth, people always think about becoming poorer, and that means maybe negatively affecting people who are poorer off. But I think a lot of degrowth scholars would argue that it's actually putting the social foundations in place and then thinking about how to attack excess consumption and decentering growth instead. Yeah. So from that perspective, I sort of do agree. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think the kind of the, I mean, it can get a bit pedantic about what exactly GDP means, right? And it's like, I guess my there there are two related concerns. Um, one is one is like do do we actually say we implemented all the good degrowth reforms that we were talking about? I don't know if aggregate global GDP would go up or down, right? Because some of those things, investment in renewables, would increase GDP. Um, uh, others might 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 decrease it, right? If you reduce uh, consumerism, right, and whatever, uh, right? But um, on aggregate, and especially since a lot of GDP these days is kind of 
imputed it's like actually a bit detached from what's what's actually going on i don't know if that number goes up or down so i can't say oh i think that we should have negative growth and that'll be good i can say i think we should have all this these policies which are degrowth policies and whatever happens to gdp is fine right and the problem as well which is related to this is i think when you sell it as a negative gdp a lot of people some of them disingenuous just say that you're trying to engineer a recession <laughs> which is like i mean it's stupid right but it is something you have to contend with absolutely and which is why i think a more focus on what for me anyway i think also because i'm not fully in the know about the dynamics of how those individual decisions would translate at a mm. macro level. I just don't have that knowledge. But for me, intuitively, when I'm thinking about what do we need as a society to address climate change, but also improve the social welfare of people, then I think the policies on the table then mandates the question of how do you finance them? And often that has to come through like limitarian policies, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, proper progressive tax. You know, um, you know, really, like I, I know the government's the world tax is off the table now, but you, you, it does mean funding pub, like long term investments in pub, funding health education to have an informed electorate, you know, having and you've got good evidence now that a four day work week actually doesn't necessarily reduce productivity. In some cases, productivity stays absolutely the same, but has a huge well-being benefit because people are given more time to spend with their kids or do the bills or whatever. Right. So actually and an environmental trying, benefit, I think there's an the environmental shows, benefit yeah. like. To also, like, it takes time to get in, interested and involved and change local politics as well. So, like, I think actually trialing those policies slowly at scale and then learning from them in, a, in an incremental way would be the way to go rather than, you know, stemming those policies which are actually quite compatible with what people also want and mm -hmm. which are popular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, we've been talking for almost two hours. This has been really enjoyable, yes. but I think it's a good place to it's a good place to stop, right? Uh, it was quite a, an optimistic place to stop. Uh, I had a question about cost benefit analysis, but we can tear into environmental economics and Nordhaus some other time. Uh, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me on. It's yeah. really been a pleasure to yeah. talk. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Ganga. Thank you.